Senator Udall, thank you so much for being with us today. You have been such a leader on environmental and climate issues over the years. So we wanted to check in with you at the end of the Trump administration, looking ahead to the Biden administration. Of all of the policies that the Trump administration has enacted or rolled back over the last four years, which do you think will have the longest term or most serious impacts on New Mexico's waters, landscapes, and communities? You bet. Well, that's that's an excellent question. And, and the thing people should know and understand is we face a really, really serious climate crisis, global warming, uh, and it's extraordinarily uh, difficult and tough. Uh, one of the things I know that's changed just since I've been in the Congress is people are seeing this around them in their daily lives, whether it's extreme events, weather events, drought, uh, a number of kinds of uh, impacts are being felt. And people can look around and say, you know, that's the climate. That's, that's the change in the climate. So knowing that we have that big issue, the thing we need to know is that the United States needs to be at the table with other countries around the world. After the Paris Agreement in the Obama administration, we really had stepped up to the plate. We had some great goals. Uh, we withdrew from that agreement under President Trump. We had a very strong administrative clean power plan uh, out of the Environmental Protection Agency. That has been dismantled. Uh, there was a, a really strong, wonderful agreement on CAFE standards. Those are the uh, automobile mileage standards. It was up to 54 miles a gallon. They were going for the auto companies and were going to do even better. So we had, and there were many other things that were appliance uh, regulations and standards and and uh, some very strong things moving us in the right direction. One of the things also that I pushed for was a renewable electricity standard, which has been adopted in almost 30 states in the United States. So take all that progress and then uh, imagine the uh, Trump administration, the Secretary of Interior, the EPA director, uh, taking a wrecking ball to all of that. Uh, that's where we are. And it's really unfortunate to me that we've seen that step back, uh, especially when you have the Chinese and the Indians and the other really big countries uh, staying at the table, determining the rules. Uh, and the reason they do that is they want to get the economic benefits. We all know that a green, uh, clean energy economy is all about jobs of the future. And those jobs are growing dramatically uh, compared to some of the other jobs in the energy area. And, and it's really important for the United States of America to be a part in that economic growth. So I, what I see happening in this new administration coming in, coming in is really uh, getting back to the table and reversing all the things uh, that set us back. Uh, and then we have a new proposal called 30 by 30, saving 30% 30 of the land and waters uh, by 2030, which is a part of the Biden-Harris plank. It's in the Democratic platform. Uh, I've been working on that for almost a year uh, with uh, groups all over the West uh, to make sure that, that uh, uh, people felt uh, that uh, this was something they could do at the local level, it could be done at the state level and also at the federal level, and make a real contribution on climate, on the extinction crisis, and on saving nature. So one of the things that I think people are a little bit concerned about is there will be legal challenges to lots of these actions by the Trump administration, but the courts are so full of Trump-era judges and nominees. Are you concerned about that at all? How will, how will the courts hold up against these challenges? Yeah, I, I, I am concerned about that, but in the climate area, there has already been a court ruling. The crucial finding, the absolute crucial finding here is that carbon pollution is a threat to public health. And that is a ruling under the Clean Air Act. Uh, this was done by 
uh, judges who were in all sorts of Democrat and Republican administrations. So that sets the groundwork to move forward under the Clean Air Act uh, and to really move us to tackling climate change and global warming. So we've known about climate change for six decades now and we just lost another four years. Um, you mentioned the 30 by 30 proposal. What else does the Biden administration need to jump on immediately in January? I, I don't think there's any doubt they need to rejoin the Paris Agreement. The meetings that take place uh, before the big annual five-year meetings, uh, we need, be, need to be at the table. So we need to get a Secretary of State approved who can start uh, getting people within the State Department up and running to get out there and participate in those meetings. I think we have to restore uh, the uh, targets in terms of getting better and better, better mileage with gasoline in our automobiles. And, and I think uh, you're going to see the Biden administration really push electric cars. I think that's one way uh, that people can really make a contribution is buying an electric car. And you know, many people now are actually putting solar panels on their roof and then charging their car. So that's a car driven by the sun rather than by being driven by uh, fossil fuels and non-renewable uh, fuels. Right. So there's lots of speculation about the Biden administration and your name has come up repeatedly as a possible Secretary of the Interior. I know you want to come home to New Mexico, but um, can you address those rumors at all? Oh, sure. I, I, uh, I know that my name is in on the list, the top list that uh, is there. Uh, I, I uh, uh, haven't been uh, really in that much uh, contact with them, uh, but I would be honored uh, to serve in a Biden administration. I don't know who wouldn't be honored to serve in the cabinet when uh, you have the kind of experience in terms of public lands and, and uh, dealing with uh, climate change and the extinction crisis, all are what you're a big part of interior. Uh, but I, I, uh, uh, I, th I really, I've known Joe Biden. I've known his family for a long time. I campaigned for him in 1972. I worked in his office before I went to law school in 1973. Uh, I've stayed in touch with him ever since. He's been a real mentor to me. And so I just want to do what's right by Joe and by Kamala. Uh, if they need my help, uh, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to weigh in and, and be a part of their administration. I, as you said, though, I love New Mexico. I love the idea of returning. This is not a retirement. Uh, this is just a new chapter in my public service. And so I hope to be doing many things in New Mexico and working on uh, Native American issues, on climate issues, on conservation, on, on even working on moving the bills, some of which haven't passed yet that uh, I, I've been working on, like the uh, uh, protection of the Gila River with wild and scenic protection, which I think you know a lot about. So certainly you, you definitely have been a leader on environmental and tribal issues. I'm curious also if there are any lessons you might have learned from your father, Stuart Udall, about what makes a good Secretary of the Interior and, and why that service is important. Yeah, well, he was, a, he was a visionary, my father, and he combined the big vision with doing. And a good example of that is uh, I remember when he was Secretary of Interior, he flew over in a uh, Bureau of Recreation, Bureau of uh, Reclamation, the, you know, the dam building, uh, and he was the, with the director of the Bureau of Reclamation, and he pointed out they were flying over southern Utah, and Floyd Dominey said, that's where the next big dam's going to be built. It's going to be a really good one, Stuart. My father looked down and saw these towering spires and beautiful country, and he said that should be a new national park. And he went back and uh, helped create Canyonlands National Park, uh, which has been a, a real success. Uh, when it was kicked off as a new national park, people came from all over the world. It's had a big economic impact in the local communities. Uh, and that's the kind of vision he had. And, and then on top of that, he was a doer. Uh, the other thing... Uh, 
that was really terrific in his administration is how do you get uh, the land and the waters protected and how do you create a fund to do that? And so he was at the, the creation of the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, to take uh, revenues from offshore oil and commit it uh, to uh, a renewable, uh, long-lasting uh, program where parks and, and uh, recreation areas and, and a variety of other areas could be preserved for future generations. So that, that was pretty amazing. And we, this year... Uh, following in that tradition, uh, put in permanent full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So every year from now on, there will be dedicated $900 million uh, to conservation and the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. In addition, that was called the Great American Outdoors Act. Another provision of that dealt with uh, back logs in the maintenance at the national parks. And so what happened there is uh, uh, we put in $10 billion uh, to make sure that we start dealing with the backlogs on the maintenance at the national parks. In a sense, we're kind of loving those national parks to death. We need to get that infrastructure up so we can protect the parks and so there can be a great visitor experience. And so as I understand it, Secretary Bernhardt, the current Interior Secretary uh, did not nominate projects for funding this year. Is that right? And can that be rectified? Or what is the, the problem there? Well, I, I think that uh, the, the Secretary has been very s slow to move on this. Uh, he only has, I think, you know, a couple of months left. Uh, and the Biden administration, uh, I would assume, is, is uh, going to take the direction of Congress and move out and use the Land and Water Conservation Fund. But never forget, half of that fund over its history, and I'm sure that will be in the future more or less, is about 50% of those funds are spent at the local level, cities and counties, at the state level. So if they have an opportunity to create a park, do a recreation area, uh, expand a park that they already have, they can apply to the federal government and get a matching grant so that they can move forward with that. And, and I would just challenge anybody, if you go into some local park that you uh, like, uh, look at the plaque and you'll see uh, half the money was probably from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And if you talk to the local people, that wouldn't have been created unless you had that matching situation and both local dollars and federal dollars were used uh, to create that park or recreation area. So I'm curious if you have any advice for soon-to-be Senator Ben Ray Lujan, especially in thinking about protecting New Mexico's land and waters. Yeah. Well, as you know, uh, Ben Ray Lujan, first of all, he, he ran a great race. Uh, he is now uh, senator for New Mexico. I will walk him down the line. He's senator-elect, really, but I'll walk him down the aisle and over to be sworn in on January 3rd. That's the tradition in the Senate. And he, he, I think, is going to represent the state very well. He's been in the House of Representatives for 12 years. Before that, he was on the Public Regulation Commission. Uh, he's smart. He's talented. He's very capable. Uh, and he's been dealing with these uh, conservation, uh, renewable energy, uh, broad uh, issues that deal with parks and public lands and wild and scenic rivers for a long time. So I, th I think he's going to be great on the conservation front. But you know the first big task that uh, this incoming administration and the new Senate is going to face is, is getting the economy back in shape and getting the pandemic under control. And we need to do the economy part safely. So we want people to go back to work, no doubt about it. But we want them to do it safely so they don't come home bring the pandemic and their grandparents or somebody in their family is injured by that. And we're, we're at a, a devastating uh, level of the pandemic right now in New Mexico and across the country. There's hardly a state that's escaping this big spike that we're seeing. So I know that's going to be Ben Ray's dedication is to work on 
economic development, on making sure we have a strong economy, putting people back to work, and keeping this pandemic under control. And one of the interesting things, Laura, that I think is happening here is people are finding that, that the tension and the anxiety and all of that caused by the pandemic is relieved some to get into the out of doors, to get into the parks and the recreation areas and have a little solitude and enjoyment and socially distance and, and be with a few family members. You know, not in big groups, but much smaller groups. And, and as we know, being outdoors is much safer, especially in this winter period and, and at all periods than indoors and cramped up uh, where all of that air is contained and it's, uh, it's more difficult and, and it's a little more toxic in that situation. Senator, thank you so much for thank your you. time and for your service to New Mexico. We're all very interested to see what you do next. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the next chapter. Good, thank you.